Good morning. I wonder if any of you have any irrational fears about uh, the medical profession. Some of you may hate going to the dentist and actually be terrified of it. I don't particularly like going to the dentist, but I'm not terrified about it. The one profession that I do have any irrational fear about is the optician. Now, I know that makes no logical sense because the optician doesn't hurt you like the dentist does, but when I go in for a test, my heart beats and I sweat and I, I breathe a huge sigh of relief when I leave the test. Um, I can remember once when I was trying contact lenses for the first time and I was sitting in the optician's chair and he was showing me how to put the contact lenses in and I started to feel faint. And he said to me, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm feeling faint. He got me to lie down on the ground so that the blood could come back to my head. I was so embarrassed that after that, I never actually went back to him. I found a new optician. <laughs> <laughs> about a month ago, I was um, across on the other side doing the jam lesson. And it was about the healing of a, a man who was born blind. And... Um, during the course of, of teaching it to the, to the kids, I was reminded of my own fear of, of the optician, and, and um, I felt quite a bit of empathy with him. The man who, who wasn't named, in the, he's not named in the Bible, but uh, between the kids and myself, we, we came up with a name, we called him Bobby, and I may refer to Bobby during the course of my sermon this morning. But the story is found in John chapter 9, and um, we're going to hopefully get through the whole chapter in the next 35 minutes. And what I'd, like to do, what I'd like you to do during the talk is to try and put yourself and see where you fit in in terms of um, your own uh, spiritual blindness. or your, It's your annual spiritual eye check, you could say, this morning. Just as you would go, hopefully, to your optician for your normal eye check once a year. If you have your Bibles, you can start turning to John chapter 9, but it will be on the screen. Um, and I'm going to be reading from the ESV. But before we start reading, just to give you a little bit of context as to where we are about the story of Jesus in uh, John's Gospel up to this point. Um, KK read from chapter 8 where Jesus was in Jerusalem for one of the feasts. And uh, he gets up and he stands up and he proclaims that I am the light of the world. And the chapter goes on, and he, we, we see a discussion that he has with some of the disciples, I mean, at least with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees say that they are all children of Abraham. And uh, Jesus says to them, well, I know Abraham. And this astounds them, because they said, you're not even 50 years old. How can you know Abraham? And he goes on to say that before Abraham existed, I am. Now, if you know your Bibles, that's the, that's the name that God gave to Moses for God. And it was clear to the Pharisees that Jesus was equating himself with God. And this made them very upset. In fact, they wanted to stone him. If anyone ever tells you that, God, that, that Jesus never claimed to be God, um, it's, they really haven't read the Gospels properly enough. Um, because he certainly does. It's not always clear when you read John if he's put the stories in chronological order or if he's put them in to emphasize a point. But John chapter 9 is placed immediately after this incident. And as you'll see as we go through it, Jesus again says that he, that he refers to himself as the light of the world. But let's start at, chapter, at verse 1 of chapter 9. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not this man, it was not this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The disciples start by asking a question that hasn't changed in the last 2,000 years. To many of us, when we go through times of suffering or um, you know, hard times, we ask ourselves, why is this happening to me? It's the concept of karma. 
You do good things, and good things will happen to you. Do bad things, and karma is going to come along and bite you in the bum, and uh, bad things are going to happen to you. And there is a little bit of truth in that. If you live an unhealthy lifestyle with things that you eat and drink um, and, and the way that you live your life, you will see the effects of some of those sins, things like obesity, emphysema, STDs, um, clogged arteries, and so on. So in those cases, we can see a cause and an effect from sinful things. But those things aside, it's often a mystery to us why we are being afflicted. We have no idea. Suffering is something that we all go through. Some of you have been through some incredible suffering, almost unbearable. And this is the case for this poor man who was born blind. I suppose you could try and think of a sin that his parents could have done that, that, that made the, the baby blind. But it is inconceivable to think of a sin that the baby could have done in the womb that caused himself to be born blind. And yet, this is what the disciples asked Jesus. Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answers by saying neither. He says that this happened so that the works of God may be displayed in him. For the past two weeks, we've been hearing from Pastor Lee from uh, Luke 4, as um, Jesus ministers in Capernaum. And we, if you remember, he starts from reading from Isaiah. Um, and, and in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah refers to it on at least three different occasions about how the Messiah is going to be coming and he's going to be opening up the eyes of the blind. So um, if you've got Luke 4, you can have a look at that later. But the, I'm going to read from another passage from Isaiah. I think in Luke 4, Jesus um, quotes from Isaiah 61. But from Isaiah 35, verses 4 to 6, let's see what I, um, Isaiah writes about this coming Messiah and what he's going to be doing. So Isaiah 35. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. I'm reminded of the promise in, in Romans 8 that says that all things work together for good. In the tapestry of this poor man's life, nothing really has gone well for him. He's been afflicted with a disability that he has absolutely no control over. But because of God's providence, Jesus is walking by at the exact same moment that this blind man is on the street. And, and Jesus is able to restore his sight. And it might be, as we, read, as we read on through the chapter, the very first time that Jesus has performed this miracle of, of restoring sight to the blind. And, and by doing so, it reaffirms his credentials as the Messiah who was sent to open up the eyes of the blind. But I'm jumping a bit ahead of the story, so let's get back to the text and let's see how Jesus goes about it. So from verse 6. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. I hope you don't think I'm heretical when I tell you that God sometimes does weird things. Like he speaks to Moses out of a burning bush. He speaks to Balaam out of the mouth of a donkey. He writes a message on the wall using a hand when he's, when he's giving a warning to King Belshazzar. Even the Bible says that the cross seems foolish or weird to those who don't understand. And Jesus has the ability, as you read the Gospels, to, to heal people that are blind in different ways. So, for example, and on, on separate occasions, he uses just his word or perhaps a simple touch, and the person's sight is restored. But on this occasion, 
he does something quite different. If you're a man, or even a lady who likes to spit, then this might become your new life verse. I'm just doing what Jesus did. But Jesus does, does something that is, quite frankly, quite weird. He spits on the ground. He makes clay, and he puts dirt into the, in, into the, eye, into the eye sockets of this man. And he tells him to go and wash at the pool, which he does, and his sight is restored. I read a commentary because I tried to understand why Jesus would do this. And um, one of the commentators said that back in creation, God used dirt to create Adam. So Adam was created from dirt, and so this is showing Jesus' um, ability to create as well, using dirt to restore the man's eyesight. I'm not sure if that's true or not. It does make a little bit of sense to me. But on, on the whole of it, it's really quite weird. And I don't have a profound answer as to why God does sometimes weird things. But I do think that it's a way of helping us build up our faith. It's a reminder that God is in control and he answers our prayers sometimes in ways that we can't conceive or we, we, we never would have thought of. And it builds up our faith and it reminds us that he's God and I'm not. And while this blind man, who I called Bobby, was born blind, he was also born spiritually blind. And this is something that each and every one of us has in common with him. We're all born spiritually blind. I'm going to jump briefly to the end of the story, where Jesus addresses the Pharisees. So jump down to verse 39. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. What does this mean? Let's start with the first sentence, that for judgment I have come into this world. People either accept Jesus or they reject him. There's no halfway. And, and Jesus becomes a dividing line between those two. The Pharisees, who've made it their, their business to study God's law, um, should be able to see that standing in front of them is the light of the world. They had those access to those, those passages in Isaiah, but they cannot see the truth for themselves and so they remain guilty of their sins. I found a quote by Spurgeon which, which really helped me to understand what Jesus is saying. This is what Spurgeon says. I used to be very backward in using spectacles for some time because I, was, I could almost see without them. And I didn't wish to be an old gentleman too soon. But now that I cannot read my notes at all without wearing spectacles, I put them on without a moment's hesitation, and I, did, and I do not care whether you think me old or not. So when a man comes to feel thoroughly guilty, he does not mind depending upon God. As we see as we'll go through the story, the Pharisees were more interested in discrediting that this, um, this miracle has ever happened than that what they should have been doing, which was rejoicing with the man who was born blind and can now see. Let's go back to the point in the story where we left and follow the blind man's journey in, in how he gets his spiritual sight. And as we go along, try to work out where you are in the trajectory of this man's um, opening of his spiritual sight, because for sure, you fall somewhere along the line. For Bobby, the day had started like every other day. Imagine for a second, if you will, that, you've never, that you were born blind, that you've never seen color, you've never seen a sunrise or a sunset, you don't even know what shapes are really. Everything is, is just darkness. He's woken up in the morning, as he's done every morning, he's felt his way along the streets, probably he had a path that he knew how to get to where he normally sat, and he sat there for the day and he begged for food. 
I'm guessing some days he would have gone to bed hungry. And then one day, which started out no different to any other day, he hears people on the street that are talking about him. He doesn't know who these people are. He's never, he's never met them. He's never spoken to them. They don't know who he is. And, and, and as he's hearing them talk about him, because they're not talking to him, they're talking about him, he hears a man spit onto the ground, he feels mud being put onto his eyes, and he gets this instruction to go and wash his eyes out at the pool. And he goes off to the pool, which he obviously knew how to get there, and as he's washing the, the, the dirt from his eyes, suddenly, amazingly, he can see! Wow! The, the neighbors and those, um, let's carry on with the story because now we get to the point where, you know when someone has had a, cha- um, a, hair, a haircut or something and they, or they've shaved and you, and you look at them and you think, something different about him but I, or something different about her but I can't quite put my finger on it. And, and you'll see that this is what the neighbors do to this poor man. So verse 8, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. Do you know that the, do you notice that the man who was previously known as the blind man, has, it remains spiritually blind? He says that Jesus is just a man who passed him by. He's obviously got some power or something, but for now he's just a man. Perhaps you're in a similar spot. You believe that Jesus was a historical figure, but that's it. Maybe he was even a good man. You probably know quite a few good people from, the, from history. Nelson Mandela was a good man. Maybe you were even fortunate enough, fortunate enough to meet him. But that's as much as, as you know about Jesus. Maybe he even is at the top of the list of good men. But that's as far as it goes. Let's track the blind man's journey a little bit further. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud in my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The man previously known as the blind man um, has progressed. He's had a bit of an opportunity to give some thought to what's happened to him. It's been an exciting day, an eventful day completely different from the rest of his life, and he concludes that Jesus must be a prophet. Here's where the spiritually blind man takes a different path to that of the Pharisees. He's concluded that he must be a prophet, but he's not sure what all that entails, but Jesus must have a higher spiritual calling. That's, that's evident. And for some of you, you may have realized that Jesus has a, a clear, is, is, has a higher spiritual calling, that he's clearly a spiritual teacher. But how that makes him different from Muhammad, from Buddha, or even the Pope, you're not quite sure. Or maybe you've, you follow more than along the path of the Pharisees, who says that Jesus could not never be God because he doesn't follow the rules. I mean, Jesus seems to make a point of doing healing on a Sabbath. I mean, there's six other days, Jesus, that you could have healed, and he, he continues to heal on the Sabbath. And this really gets up the noses of the Pharisees. It doesn't fit in with the way they believe the Messiah should be. And we all know that the gospel means good news, but for some of us, it really gets up our noses as well. We don't like the fact that Jesus says, I am the way. 
because that sounds so exclusive, and we don't like exclusive, exclusivity. We want to do things our way. Well, perhaps you don't like the fact that Jesus says that without me, you can do nothing. You may say, well, you don't know me. I've done some incredible things. I've built up a business um, all by myself. I've, I've done some incredible things. But when it's all said and done, all those things count for nothing because without Jesus, you cannot buy your way into heaven. You cannot buy your own salvation. So the Pharisees say what many of us also say, I need more evidence. So they call the man's parents. Verse 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And he asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but now he... But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. The parents represent yet another form of spiritual blindness. They had been presented with the truth, but they had failed to commit to it. Some of you may have been coming to church for years, and you know the truth about Jesus like the back of your hand. You could recite them, but you've never made this step of faith from head knowledge into your heart. Why do the parents not commit? They're afraid of the consequences. They're afraid of what is going to happen to them. They almost throw the blind man under the bus. They say, we don't know, just ask him. And this is their son. Maybe, maybe it sums up your position 100%. You're afraid of what people may think of you. You're afraid of what you may have to give up. Let's see what happens next. Verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Wow, what an exchange. You have to admire the cheek of the man. There's a, a great Hebrew word that describes it, um, the absolute chutzpah of, of how he just... <laughs> relates to these Pharisees and, and challenges them. And, and, and what it boils down to is that he says, I know what I know. This morning I woke up blind, like I've woken up every day of my miserable life, and now I can see. It's not in the text, but I can imagine that as he was looking at the Pharisees, he, he was thinking to himself, I never knew what ugly meant until I'm see seen you guys. But he goes on to say, you know that in all of Scripture that you guys spend your lives poring over, there is no mention whatsoever of anyone having their sight restored in the history of the world, and this is the first time that it's happened. And so the man concludes, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. He's at the point of taking that step of faith. 
He really couldn't care what all these so-called educated people think. He's had first-hand experience, and he knows what he knows. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. It's now that the blind man has taken the final step. He was right when he said Jesus was a man, because he was a man. He was right when he said Jesus was a prophet, because he was a prophet. He didn't understand everything, and it had been an incredibly unsettling and stressful and eventful day. But now, given the opportunity to believe in the Son of Man, now the Son of Man is a, a, a description which dates back to Daniel, which talks about the coming Messiah or the Christ. He says, do you believe, Jesus says to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he does so. And what does he do next? He worships Jesus. Friends, have you taken that step of faith yourself? Maybe you feel weighed down by the, by the sins that you've committed. Look at the way that the Pharisees treat the man. They say, you were born in utter sin. It's contempt. And compare that to the way that Jesus treats him. He goes looking for him when he hears that he's been cast out. Effectively excommunicated. But, and Jesus, being full of grace and truth, he merely says to the man, do you believe? He doesn't list all the sins that this man has done. And, and, and certainly he would have been a sinner just like us. He doesn't list any of them. He just asks him to believe. There's a story in the Bible about another Pharisee that God made physically blind in order that he may receive spiritual, spiritual sight. The man tells the story when he's on trial in front of King Agrippa, and it's found in Acts 26. And I'm going to read you that story about this Pharisee whose name was Saul. And, and, and at the end of the, the section, he's given a, a, a task, a message from Jesus about what he wants him to do. Um, just to, because I think it flows easier, I'm going to be reading from the Message Bible this particular section from Acts 26. And this is Saul speaking as he's giving testimony. For a time, I thought it was my duty to oppose this Jesus of Nazareth with all my might. Backed with the full authority of the high priests, I threw those believers, I had no idea they were God's people, into the Jerusalem jail, right and left. And whenever it came to a vote, I voted for their execution. I stormed through their meeting places, bullying them into cursing Jesus, a one-man terror obsessed with obliterating these people. And then I started on the towns outside Jerusalem. One day, on my way to Damascus, armed as always with papers from the high priests authorizing my action, right in the middle of the day, a blaze of light, light outshining the sun, poured out from the sky on me and my companions. O oh, king, it was so bright, we fell on our, knee, on, on our faces. Then I heard a voice in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you out to get me? Why do you insist on going against the grain? I said, who are you, master? The voice answered, I am Jesus, the one you're hunting down like an animal. But now, up on your feet, I have a job for you. I've handpicked you to be a servant and witness to what's happened today and to what I am going to show you. This is the part that I want you to really listen to. I'm sending you off to open the eyes of the outsiders so that they can see the difference between dark and light and choose light. See the difference between Satan and God and choose God. I'm sending you off to present my offer of sins forgiven and a place in the family, inviting them into the company of those who begin real living by believing in me. It's an incredible thought that, that at that moment when we, when we accept Christ, we begin real living. That excites me. We're about to share in what is sometimes called the Lord's Supper. It was something that Jesus implemented 
um, in the upper room before he went to the cross. And it's something that he wanted us to remember him by, to remember his death, the price that he paid for our full and complete salvation. And by sharing this meal together, we enter into worship. We worship Jesus through the bread, which represents his body that was broken for us. We worship Jesus through, his, through the wine, through his blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. You'll know inside you where you stand in terms of your own spiritual blindness. If you've never accepted the light of the world, the light of the world that gives life, then don't partake of the, of the meal. It'll just be a mockery. Pass it by. Nobody's going to be watching you. But if the light of Jesus who has, has finally dawned on you, even if you've been coming for years, then take a moment to seek repentance and accept this gift of grace. And by doing so, we will rejoice with you as you share in the communion. As we read in that, that last section from the Message Bible, you'll be welcomed into the family and we will rejoice. I'm going to pray for the bread and the wine and then the stewards are going to come up and distribute it from the front to the back. Take a piece of the bread and take a small cup of the wine. I, th I think it's actually grape juice, so don't panic. And partake of it in your own time. When the baskets come round to collect the, the used cups, then the worship team are going to come up and, and lead us in worship and sing passionately as we remember of all that Jesus has done for us today. Let's pray together. Father God, we want to thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world who stepped down into darkness, opened my eyes, and let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you, hope for a life spent with you. And as we share in this communion service this morning, we are so grateful for all the, the, for the sacrifice that was paid for us once and for all for the forgiveness of our sins for my sin. Thank you for the bread that represents the body broken. Thank you for the wine that represents the blood that was shed for my forgiveness. Thank you for the cross, my friend. We worship you this morning. We love you. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>